Well, uh, hi, I'm Les Pinter, and uh, I'm doing a presentation today on why um, React is the perfect destination for rewriting your Box Pro applications. It's a little poignant because this is probably my last presentation uh, of my career, but uh, let's do it. Not the first book ever written on programming in Foxborough back in 1989. I bought copy number 252 of Foxbase, um, and I've been programming ever since. Actually, I studied for a PhD in economics at Rice University, but I, I had a child with cancer and uh, was not up to the task, so I, I never finished it. And in fact, uh, my son died in 2002 at the age of 34. But back in 1979, two friends of mine and I from Spring Branch High School in Houston developed a word processor called the Magic Wand, and uh, we started selling it. And on September the 23rd, a uh, 24-year-old kid from Seattle called up and asked if he could buy our source code. And uh, we negotiated a price, and the next day I picked him up at the airport, drove him to my house, made him a grilled cheese sandwich, and sold him the program that's called Microsoft Word today for $35,000. That was uh, my first foray into microcomputer programming, and I've been doing it for 40 years. I've written seven books about programming. I published a Fox Pro newsletter for um, 10 years, monthly. Uh, I've written over 260 articles for my own journal and for others. Um, I have written a more recent book, went back to economics, my original career, and wrote a book about John Nash of... Uh, <clears throat> A beautiful mind fame uh, and um, economics uh, programming the internet um, you ought to take a look at it it's on it's on uh, it's on the internet at any rate I'm going to talk first about the differences between Fox Pro and the react paradigm gonna we're going to yes and create create react dot uh, create react app we're going to talk about the, the Visual Studio Code Editor, which is not the same as Visual Studio, by the way. It's a separate product. Um, talk about the structure of a, of a React app, about components, which are the, the building blocks of React, about data management, which is real different, and how to get started. Okay. React is a single-page application. Uh, rather, it's for building single-page applications. You load one page, and thereafter, any changes that the user sees on the screen are changes to that page. There's not another page. Um, I'll tell you what this list, what the differences are, but I'll throw them one at, um, one at a time. React app loads as a single huge JavaScript file. All of your pages are in one program. And in fact, your whole, Java, your whole React app is about 12 files. So when you go from one page to the next, or when your browser looks like you're going from page to the one page to the next, you're really just reloading pieces into the same page, into the same browser window, from a single large file. In that way, it's just like an executable, except Fox Pro execu executables aren't really executables. They're FXPs, which, as you may know, is then interpreted by the Fox Pro runtime engine. Well, <clears throat> JavaScript files to machine language. It first runs an interpreter, but it launches a compiler in background, and as soon as the compiler finishes, it switches over to the compiled code. So it actually runs faster than FoxPro. How could anything be faster than FoxPro? It didn't seem possible to me. Well, it is, although you may not be able to tell the difference. Designs in React are based on components, which are little functions that return pieces of HTML and JavaScript. Pages are then collections of components. One page, you, know, max, you may actually have two or three or more components on a single inside another component, which looks to the user like data is returned using an asynchronous method, either JavaScript's native fetch or an Axios get call. We'll talk more about that as well. Returning data is not a big deal. It just takes three lines of code. But in Fox Pro, it takes nothing. Use table name. You're in your data language in the world acts like that, so I think React and Axios make it about as easy as it can get. You do have to write an API to get your data, but an API to run on your server can be written in 10 lines of code. I, re I did one yesterday in 10 minutes, beginning to end, including creating the SQL tables.
So it's not hard. Sensitivity. That's a big one. Fox Pro never has been case sensitive. It doesn't care. You can type uppercase, lowercase. You can mix and match in the same program. It doesn't care. Well, that means that you've been trained to think the wrong way because uh, Fox Pro, because JavaScript absolutely is case sensitive. Until you get used to it, it'll be the source of many, many bugs. Um, generally, by the way, you should use Pascal case for your components. Although when you create a React project folder, it has to be all lowercase. Can have dashes or underscores, but has to be all lowercase. Everything else, Pascal case is good. Okay. Editor. It's called VS Code. You can download it free from my, a Microsoft website. And every time you run it, it checks to see if there's a newer version, which there is every month or two. It's amazing. You know, I, I, I said at one point in the write-up for this presentation that when I said that React is the perfect destination for Fox Pro apps or the perfect medium for developing them, I should have said Visual Studio Code, JavaScript, HTML5, Cascading Style Sheets, and three or four other elements, Axios, Web Servers, SQL Server, that those seven or eight components are the perfect replacement for the Fox Pro IDE. Because it really takes a village. Oh, how is that better if it takes eight different products to do what one does? Well, here's why. Each of those pieces does the equivalent of what, the, of what Fox Pro does a little bit better, sometimes a lot better. So that's why it ends up being better. Would it be better if it were all in one package? I don't know. Uh, but I'll tell you, the, the, the combination of those pieces works wonderfully. Visual Studio Code has 100 keyboard shortcuts. You can eventually get to the point where it's just the number of keystrokes is next to nothing. It's like when you watch your, your niece typing on her phone and you think, how the hell can she be so fast? Well, she uses autocomplete. That's why. Well, that's what, that's what, that's what keyboard shortcuts and Emmet are in Visual Studio Code. Emmet is actual shortcuts, words that you can type to write out a little skeleton of code for you. For example, most React functions about 10 lines of code. If you type R-A-F-C-E and press the tab key, it writes those 10 lines of code for you using the file name that you're in as the name of the function that it's writing. So it takes one second, boom, you're there. And there are many, many others of those. So as you get used to them, and the more you use them, the more you'll find that Emmet shortcuts are really useful, and keyboard shortcuts are even better. So get get close to your editor. Um, you'll like it. There's one other thing. Within the editor, there's something called hot loading or hot reloading. As you type in your code, if you stop typing for a couple of seconds, it will automatically save it and your browser window, which hopefully is, rush, is running on your other, your other video monitor, will instantly be updated to show the results of what you just did. It's not the same as a WYSIWYG editor, and in fact there is no WYSIWYG editor for React, but the combination of VS Code and a browser window open on the, on the other screen is not only just as good, I think it's even better. In Fox Pro, you use the, the property window, the property sheet, to make changes to the appearance of a component, of, a, of, a, of an element. Well, you use style sheets instead in Visual Studio, and, and rather in, in HTML. It's called cascading style sheets, or CSS. There are actually three ways you can apply styles in React, uh, but style sheets are probably the best. I have seen style sheets that are commercially available some free, with thousands of styles in them. Well, you got to learn their names, but hopefully they have a certain naming convention that makes sense. And after a while, you remember, oh, that style will do. There are, there are also many other extensions that you can install into Visual Studio Code. One of them puts a SQL um, uh, manager right into your editor, sort of like what Fox Pro has. I mean, you can tile a, type a select statement and it'll bring back your code and display it right there in the editor. So these extensions are very powerful. I have about 20 of them 
installed in my version of Visual Studio that I use, a uh, Visual Studio code that I use every day, you really ought to take a look at them. There, uh, there are, uh, are on the web, just Google uh, valuable or important extensions for Visual Studio code and you'll see what I mean. Okay, with HTML and CSS, FoxPro uses controls. So you can create a control called command button or command print. And then within your code, you'll say this form dot command print dot whatever, set the background color or whatever. React uses styles. Uh, oh, and by the way, HTML has about 100 tags, but you'll only use about 20 of them. Many of them are there for, for legacy reasons. And in fact, in React, most people use almost exclusively a div, which is a division, and you assign a class name to it, but there, it, it completely changes what it looks like. Also, almost all of the events in HTML can be applied to almost all of the elements. So you can do a click on a div, a button, a paragraph, a whatever you want. So it's, it's really a lot easier. Now, React uses styles using the class name keyword. Class is reserved for something else, so you have to say class name with a capital N, lowercase c, capital N, and then name the class. The class comes usually from your .css file. Um, by the way, in the .css file, class names have to start with a period um, because that means this is a class name. Um, if it doesn't start with, if it starts with a pound sign, that means this applies to this ID, and you can give an ID to some or all of your elements. If it doesn't start with either a pound sign or a period, it's a tag, like P for paragraph, DIV for div, H1 for a top, for a largest uh, styled um, heading, and so on. And style them in one place, that style applies to every single occurrence of that, of that tag, or of tags with, uh, with that ID, or of tags with that class name inside their class names list. And by the way, class, you can have multiple class names and it just tells them. It cascades, da da. Styling can be done in one of three ways inside a React component. And this is a little detailed, but I just want it to be there for completeness. You can style inline. Here you can see style equals background colon value, comma, property, colon, value, comma. The values have to be in quotes. This is enclosed, by the way, in double curly braces when it's used in this format. If you name a variable that has styling in it, you then refer to it with single curly braces. By the way, single curly braces generally means this is JavaScript, or this is a JavaScript variable. This is, so that's why it's got the curly braces. If on the other hand you have a style library, it will look like what's below. If the library name ends in .css, you can have as many of these attributes as you want set with a value. This asterisk, by the way, means just apply this to everything. That's the font I want to use for my pages. Generally, if I don't specify a size, make it 11 points and so on. This means paragraphs have to have a, a, the blue text. This means anything with the heading class is going to look like this. Then within your component, you say include stylelive.css, and by the way, I should have said slash stylelive.css, which means it's in this folder. If it's any place else, use to pass to point to it, but uh, that's, not, that's actually not right. It should be dot slash. Then if the div where you want to use a class, say div space class name with double n equal than the name of the style. Remember, you don't put a period when you refer to it here. The period goes up here in the CSS file to tell it that that's a class name, not a tag. Now in FoxPro, this form dot control name is how you refer to a control. But in JavaScript, you have to tell it to return a reference. And in your code, you'll say button equals document dot query selector all parentheses and then one of three types of selectors. If it's just a string, it means these tags. If it's a string, if it's a quoted string with a period at the beginning, that means find elements that have that class name, that contain that class name. If it has a pound sign, it means return all the elements with that ID. 
the difference between all and not having and not using uh, rather between query selector all and just plain query selector is that query selector returns the first one that matches query selector all returns them all well if it returns, returns all you've then got an array and down here at the bottom document dot query selector all returns all the h2s which you can then in line say for each H, x such that x dot style equals which is how you set the background color for the style of each of those views. by the way when I put this on a new line it doesn't matter whether it's on the same line or a new line it doesn't matter whether or not there's a period a space before the period or not uh, JavaScript ignores it so does she C sharp for that matter okay generally within a component you're returning JSX JSX look, looks like HTML. It has code inside it. The code is in curly braces. It means this is JavaScript. There's a preprocessor called Babel that runs inside of React. And in fact, you might even say Babel is React. It translates the JSX into pure HTML. CSS and JavaScript by the times it gets to the browser. Browsers, by the way, do not know anything except um, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. So it has to convert it. Um, if you've ever used the Visual Studio to create a web page, those controls that, it, that, you, that you see, they're also used to pass parameters to those uh, JavaScript tags and set the attributes when the tags generate. What to the browser is pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's all. Okay, variations are a little different. I've got some sample code, and I'm going to go to it right now. When you open up Visual Studio, for example, here I've got one called, I've got a project called uh, the samples code that comes with this presentation which I'll upload after we're finished talking uh, contains six or seven folders and one of them is called my first um, you create a react app in a particular way and you end up with a structure that looks like this the central programming is called the central program is called app.css now here I've built one that says um, wow, let's do it this way. Sorry about that. There's the default export. Okay. This code is in the of your React app. And I can show you in a moment why it runs. It's got a div. It's got an H1, which is a heading. And then I've got a reference to a component. My component is this. And all it does is say, I'm going to receive props, which are called props in React. And I want to put a paragraph tag down here, 24 point font, that says, hi, props.name. That means whatever was passed as a prop with the, with the ID name. And are you still at props.phone? That got there because of this. No, it didn't because of this. I actually have name equals that and phone equals that. These are not declared anywhere else. These are like parameters, but you can put in whatever you want. I can put in that. It'll just be ignored because reference to it in the code. But when you put in these props, they can be whatever you want. However, if you capitalize it here, you better capitalize it here. It won't recognize it. And that's what it does. This isn't very interesting. I've got a hard-coded name. You'd think that I at least would want to use a variable. And here I did. So now instead of putting this, I'm going to put name. 
except that since it's JavaScript, it goes in curly braces. And lo and behold, get over there. Let me show you that again. Fail to compile because it doesn't know what name is. Oh, you mean a variable. There it is. By the way, I didn't file save there. After two seconds, it refreshes. That's because one of the extensions that I loaded in is one that says do an automatic save after two seconds after uh, two seconds after you stop typing, and re and it will refresh the page. Here's why it refreshes it. React components refresh automatically when a pass to them is changed, and the prop. Well, here change. But let's change it. Well, if I do this and tell it on click, name to Fred. Will that work? No, it didn't. Here's why. This is VAR. It's a variable. That's not what you use in React. You can use variables for other purposes internal computations within your, your methods. But what you want to do is use what's called a state variable. Now I've got an alternative version of this down here. It says up in my uh, import statement for React, I included I pulled in references to use state and use effect. I didn't actually use use effect here, but use state is a way of creating state variables. And this is how you do it. <clears throat> you do this thing, which whose name I have, I'm having a senior moment, but I'll think of it in a minute. Um, that says create a variable called name, a state variable called name, and create a function called set name, which when you call it, passes the parameter that you passed into that state variable. So instead now, we just refer to the state variable, but in the on click, we tell it all set name, and this is a way of saying pass, pass the uh, thread as a variable. You go over to this and click on it changes it to Fred. So that's, you know, it's a little more involved than just setting a variable to a value in Fox Pro, but it's always exactly the same. You use use state to create the variable and the function to set it, and then you use within the on click, you put the call, calls the function in parentheses. And by the way, I think yeah, Oh, and by the way, you can't just say on click equals red. Let us take that out because if you do, that means run it right now because when parentheses appear down in an on click expression, that means run it now. So you instead have to use this. Uh, I'm sorry, there was another point I wanted to make, but it's not important. There's actually another use, but this will do. That's sort of how you do things. React. Let's move that out of the way. Okay. When you install, when you start working with React, you have to start by installing Node.js uh, service. Go to nodejs.org. It has a download button, download it, it will install it and set it up to run as a service so that every time you restart your computer, it'll start Node in the background. It also installs a program called NPM, Node Package Manager, and NPX, which is Node Package Executor, I suppose, or Executor. NPM is used to install. Well, one of the, the things you're going to want to install is React Router DOM because that's how you do do menus in React. 
install it with install space dash G, which means globally. I want to be able to use it for any, any other projects I create in the future. React router DOM. And then in your component, you would put right at the top, import React router DOM, nav link, switch, or what else ever, whatever else from this. To change pages, stop that. From this thing that you imported up here, and then you can use nav links to display your menu selection and route to execute them. And here's what it looks like. That's a nav link that would say, click here for about us. That says wherever this is located, stuff in the about us component in that exact location. So when this is clicked, do this. And that's how you do it. You can't use an anchor tag, as you might would in, um, in ordinary HTML, because an anchor tag goes to the server and loads a page. You want to do. This is a single page application. We don't go back and load other pages. So no anchor tags. There's always another way. It's this. Data. Wow. The big D. Data is the best thing about FoxPro. And the worst thing about everything else, as you may have noticed if you made forays into, well, anything else. In FoxPro, use a, a table, literally, use space table name. You're in it, you're in your data, you're attached to your data, you can show your data, you can browse your data, you're in your data. Well, it doesn't work like that anywhere else. In React and every other web-based application, data is fetched from a web source and then stored in state variables, which are either scalars, objects, or arrays of objects. State variables can only be displayed in the component that fetched them or in child components of that component, unless you use something called use context. More about that later. I hate Redux. <laughs> it's, I hate everything about it. I will rant. Um, at length shortly. Well, here's the deal. React apps don't have global variables. Data is from the top down. You create a component and then within it, if you reference another component, you can pass data from the parent component as props. But if for some reason you want to have data that's created in one component, and displayed five components later, you have to pass it as a prop from component to component to component to component, which is a pain in the butt. If on the other hand, you want to, dis to create it or retrieve it in one component and then display it in another component, which is not in the chain of the first component. Uh, that usually wouldn't happen at the root component level, but you know, a second level component might have some data that you want to use another second level component elsewhere. You can't pass it up and over and down. You instead have to use either a data context and a reducer or Redux. And I will have a small example of that shortly. Redux is a third party component that has been popular with React developers. But the new use context and use Redux hooks are not only a viable alternative, they get better every few months. They release a new version, some new feature, another, another hook. And gradually I suspect that Redux will, will, uh, stop being used. So be sure and learn about use context and use and use reducer as soon as you can. Okay, let's get to uh, let's get to doing something. Go to nodejs.org and download the Windows installer probably. We're all <laughs> painted ladies for Microsoft so we're all using Windows. Run, download and run the Windows installer and it will install Node as a service. It'll also install, install NPM and NPX. So as soon as it's finished, open a DOS prompt which will put you here in users backslash your user ID. If it says less, well, call me. <laughs> It'll say whatever your user ID is. Then type NPM space install space dash G for global space create react app separated by dashes and that installs this package that uh, that node can use to create react applications they have a particular structure a particular directory structure there's no project folder as there is in Fox Pro but there's a directory structure and it's always the same 
once you have installed NPM and NPX and create React app, within that same folder, type NPX, create React app, and then a React app name. It can be anything you want as long as it's all lowercase. Uh, that, and that's the only case where you have to use lowercase only, but React apps have to be named with a lowercase. As soon as it's finished, which will probably be two or three minutes later, change into that directory with CD, whatever your, your app name is, and then type code space period to launch VS Code opened in the folder you just created. Use Alt-Tab to go back to the DOS prompt and type npm space start. That'll pop up this window that you see here, running your first React app. Now that's npx, not npm. Why? Because it installs packages and XP, npx runs them. So they're both installed by the installation of VS Code, of uh, Node, and they'll, they'll both be there. So where does this come from? Okay, getting ahead of myself. First, let's talk a little bit about the VS Code Editor. It updates every month or two automatically. There's a cheat sheet within the help menu, or you can also download it at codevisualstudio.com, shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts, windows, dot PDF. And um, you need to develop a close personal relationship with them as soon as possible. Code uh, VS Code also uses something called Emmet, which is Content Assist. It's like snippet expansion in Fox Pro. There are many, many, many snippets. If by any chance yours is not supporting Emmet to begin with, open the settings file that's in the lower left of the VS Code editor. There's a settings um, asterisk down there. Go and and when you, it opens up a, a an actual uh, um, JSON file and you'll go down and make sure that you have emmet.trigger expansion on tab colon true and that's that makes sure that typing a key a, 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 an abbreviation or a snippet and pressing tab will expand it into its corresponding code. While you're at it there are many other extensions that you can install into the VS Code editor. There's a bracket pair colorizer which when you're six pairs of, of brackets deep you will thank me for. There's prettier, which colorizes them in a very, in, 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 and, uh, and shows you. There's the Chrome debugger. There's the, Re there's the React debugger. There's MySQL, which is a free database uh, that installs individual code into Visual Studio Code. And you're actually, you can do things with your database pretty much like you can in Fox Pro. It's an extension. You have to decide whether you want to use MySQL or Microsoft SQL. Maybe others as well, I just haven't tried them. The extensions icon in the lower left looks like this. And if you filter the list by most popular, you can see which ones you that you install. Be sure and add the Chrome debugger and React DevTools. Also, you can Google best VS Code extensions for React and you'll see a list of 20 or 30 of them. Hell, get them all, <laughs> they're, they're free. Okay, the, now back to what I started to talk about earlier. When you open up your, you use npm start to run your first React app. This is the screen you'll see. Here's why you see it. This is app.js and from header down to slash header, that's the content that you see in that page, including the little A class name learn React. By the way, that does actually launch the corresponding website. So if that's what you want to do in React, you can do that. It's just not what you use to update inside your own pages. So there is that. In app.js, cut out the header to slash header block and put in something else. Let's say this, just h1, my first modification to a React app. <laughs> Well, that's what I said to type, but I actually, my example has something different. At any rate, you'll want to put in this, which is, which is in 
app.css, that's the default CSS file for your application, and put in this code, and it does that to whatever you put in the H1 tag. So, <laughs> been, would have been nice if those were uh, if those were the same text, but I just forgot. So shoot me. React works by adding components, either class-based or functional, in the source folder or in subfolders that you create under the source folder. Because of hot reloading, changes will be displayed instantly. You use npm start to run your app, and it runs at localhost port 3000. If you happen to close your browser window, not to worry, just reopen it, open the Chrome browser, and then type local, actually just type L, and it'll say, oh, you mean localhost port 3000? Press enter, and you're back where you started. Drop back to the DOS prompt, which by the way, you can use with, I think it's control back tick, the VS Code editor, and type npm install dash G, whatever the name of the package is. Okay, and here's what you're gonna to wanna to know later on, but I'll satisfy your curiosity curiosity now. If from the DOS prompt, you type npm run build, it'll add a folder called slash build to your folder, to your directory structure. Inside it, you'll find about 10 or 12 files, a JS file or two, two a, a CSS file or two, and a few others. That's what you deploy to your website. Just FTP it to your website, and you are done. That node modules folder with the 40,000 files and, and folders in it, you do not need. It's used by the build process, used by React while it's running. You don't need it when you deploy. And in fact, if you ever want to give somebody a copy of your code, for God's sake, do not copy the node modules folder. Just leave it out. If you're in your folder and you type npm space install, we'll recreate the entire node modules folder, all 40,000 files of it, anytime you need it. So don't copy the node modules folder and send it to anybody. You don't need it. I wish there was a react copy all except function. I guess I could write one. Yeah, it's just a little batch file. Okay, let's talk about react components. There are two kinds of components. Originally, in the early days of React, there was one kind, class-based. Class, whatever the name is, so the name of the folder it's contained in, extends react.component. There's a shortcut way that you can say that as well. And then within it, for what state items, state variables you want, and then a render function that then contains a return with JSX in it, and that's where your function is, is laid out. <clears throat> I mean, your, your, your component is laid out. It ends with export default, whatever the name of the class is. The alternative, which is used, which was developed a little bit later, is called a functional component or presentational component. It doesn't use the React dot component class. Instead, you simply define it as a const, as a function. Uh, I prefer to use this arrow syntax, uh, the anonymous function syntax, but there's another function syntax you can also use. Works the same. And then you return in parentheses div. No render call. Again, it ends with export default, whatever the, the, the component name is. These are being used more and more frequently, and class is being deprecated. So frankly, if you build everything using, using nothing but functional components, you'll probably be glad you did. So I include this for completeness, but you can probably ignore most of what I say when I talk about class components. There's, they don't give you anything more than what you get with functional components, and it takes more typing, so who needs that? Now, components are written in JavaScript, not HTML. You'll notice that all the files in a React component are .js files not HTML files. There's only one HTML file in app, and if you go up above source, there's a directory called public, and inside public, there's an index.html, and it has one thing in it that matters. It has a div called, with the ID of root, R-O-O-T. The JavaScript 
the index.js function that's back in your source folder, just above your source folder, that is actually run by Webpack, and that's what creates the React, that's what packages and builds and runs the React application, is automatically called, and it goes and looks for the root folder, for the root element, the one named root, the one with the ID of root. And that's where it puts all of your, everything you build, all of your components go inside that. So that's how it knows. It's like if you put index.html in any web folder, that's what it's going to display. Unless you put index. or, oh, what are the others? Um, I forget. At any rate, there are four or five reserved names for all web apps run if, and, and React kind of does that too, but Webpack is what does it. JS allows you to commingle HTML and JavaScript. It is transpiled before it's run. That means it's converted to pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Within JSX, most of just HTML. If you have a JavaScript expression, you put it in curly braces. That means this is JavaScript. Ternary expressions are used ex it's this. Evaluate X, whatever it is. If it is true, display A, generally a component. If it's not, display B, generally null. So if this is true, do that, otherwise do that. And you're going to find that a lot. So what is this X? That X is generally a state variable, generally a Boolean. Why? Because anytime you change it from true to false or from false to true, all the code's going to be re-rendered that depends on it. That's what changing a state variable does. That's what it means. That's the engine that runs your React apps. So state variables are going to be a big deal, and ternary expressions that refer to your Booleans are going to be a big deal. So keep an eye out for that. And remember, curly braces means this is code. And here I'm just saying the same thing I just said. <laughs> when you create state variables in a class-based component, there's a function called setState. Actually, it's this dot setState because everything in a class is this dot something. And that's what you use to set a value of a state variable. Now, with setState in a class-based component, you'll use the JSON notation. Curly braces, variable name, colon, value. In a functional based component, you create a variable name, comma, and a function to update it. One function, one update function. You can have five set state statements. You can have 50. Each one is responsible only for its own value. The reason that's, or its own variable. The reason set state uses a JSON format for the variable is because you can set several state variables in a single set state call. You don't have to, but it will update just a part of state. Set followed by variable name, which you created with use state, just updates the one state variable. And that's used in functional components. So sometimes you see set state, and sometimes you see set banana, where banana is the name of one of your state variable your state variables. Which is why when you have a component that should only appear sometimes you use a ternary expression. This dot, that state variable is the one that's changed by calling set whatever it is, the variable name. And that says, if it's true, do this, otherwise do that. Or if it's true, display this component, otherwise don't display it. So the curly braces again tell React is JavaScript, and the call to the set function tells it change that variable and therefore re render this function, this statement. Oh, and by the way, in class-based components, again, class-based component state variables are preceded by dot state dot. That's needed in class-based components, but it's not necessary in components, in functional components. Just one more thing to remember. Okay, React components are React components are JS files. However, when you refer to them in your import statements, you don't need to write dot JS because that's the default. If it doesn't have an extension, it is a JavaScript function, and almost everything you import will be one. There are a few exceptions. You always start by saying import React, lowercase. That's because 
it's one of those things that was installed by NPM and it knows where to find it. If you have multiple components inside a single JavaScript file, you can tell it which one or which ones you want to pull out by naming them inside curly braces. And this has a name, which again, I'll think of in a second. Should be called extreme, but they decided to use a different name because what the hell? We always make up a new name, don't we? Remember? <laughs> When they said that when you write XML to a text file, you have to call it, oh, now I forget that too. There's a name, persist. You have to persist XML to disk. Don't write it to disk, that's old fashioned. Persist it. What does persist mean? Write. And when you read it back, and I'm not making this up, depersist. What? <laughs> Why do they do this to us? At any rate, this, feature here is not called extracting. It's got another name and senior moment. I'll think of it in a minute. Then import customer from quote slash com component slash customer means I've got a components subdirectory under my source directory. And this, J this JavaScript file is down there. It'll go bring it in. When you import cascading style sheets, you don't have to give them a name. You don't have to e extract them to another name. Um, and by the way, a lot of the examples will have a semicolon, but you don't need semicolons after unexecutable statements in JavaScript, so they they don't end with semicolons because they don't have to. Oh, destructuring there. I even put it on here to remind myself. That's called destructuring instead of extracting. Isn't that special? Finally, almost all components end with the statement export default in the name of the component. That just means when you import it, you can import it like this without putting it in in uh, curly braces. Data handling. Can we talk? <clears throat> Data can be retrieved from a web API using JavaScript's fetch or Axios. What's an API? An API is a little function that runs on a web server somewhere and returns, in our case, JSON data. It has to it has to be JSON. JSON has a particular structure. The original the, the, the idea that Microsoft came up with what 15 years ago was XML, but it soon became clear that everybody hated XML, so JSON is an easier to read form of a text file containing data. <clears throat> By default, ASP.NET API uh, websites return XML, but there's a single line of code you can change in one of the default files that will tell it, no, return JSON instead. By the way, J-S-O-N, I, I pronounced it, but then I heard a guy, the guy who invented it speak at a conference and he calls it JSON, so it's JSON. Now, when you return data, you'll always put it into state variables because where else would you put it? You could, you could just create a var, uh, variable name and then put the data there, but it's not very useful thereafter. If you put it in state variables, then whatever you do with it, for example, there's a filter statement. If you apply a filter to your array of data that came back from your API, it automatically re-renders because you just changed a state variable, a state array. So the most important design decision in building React applications is what state variables you're going to create. But shortly we'll get to how you write an API. You, I wrote one the other day in 10 minutes, including creating the SQL table that it read from. Just wanted to try something out. Now, if you're in a class-based component, you have to call the web API particular overridable method uh, called component did mount. There are six stages of building and displaying a component. Component mount is called after the component has been rendered. I worked in a system for a company called Pro Business Payroll that had 24 hooks in it that were simply named functions called in a subdirectory named after the client. And if that function was present, it called it at that point in the code. The guy that owned the company sold it to ADP for six for $165 million a couple of years later. You know how much of that I got? None. 
So the Bill Gates episode is not the only time I've made a stupid business decision. At any rate, component did mount. So that is called at a particular place where it is convenient to store your array of data that comes back from the API. So within, let's say we have a class called get data, extends React component, that means it's a class-based component. You declare state, an array named item. This means, that means this is an array. Then within component did mount, you call fetch, which is a JavaScript function. And then says then convert it to JSON and then this simply means let's call what came back result. Use set state to put result.data into items. Well what is result? Whenever you call a web API it returns six pieces within its the, the object that it returns. One of them is called called status. It's a 200 if your data, if your call to the to a, a data sub, uh, provider worked. It's 404 if your URL couldn't be found, and so on. And there are a few others, but is one of the six properties of that thing that's sent. So result.data is just the data. Set state knows what to do with it, provided that it's in JSON format. And let's just make sure that it is. This is actually not necessary if you know that your API is producing JSON, correctly formatted JSON. But th here, result, <clears throat> this stumped me for the long time. It just means call it came back result. You could call it X, it doesn't care. Just make sure that this is the same name. What is this? This is JSON. Set state to this array, remember array, store these results, the dot data portion of what came back from the web server. So it's it's really, that's not, dot data is not arbitrary at all. It's what it's called. In a functional component, instead of component did mount, you use use effect. Where do you get use effect? You import it from React using this deconstruction here. I want two functions, use state to create a, a state property, a state variable that's going to trigger re-rendering, and use effect to set that to a value, whatever I pass in parentheses. Here I create, I, my function name is called item list. This is the anonymous function format, what's called an arrow function, that just says this is a function. That declares the items array and the function to use state says start with an empty array and then fetch it then and here's the same thing return results such that result.data gets why because we call it set items and set items is a function whose only purpose is to take that and put it there Funny, but after you've looked at it a few hundred times, you'll be, oh yeah, that's what it is. So again, the reason state variables are so important is that when their values change, the component and any components that derives from it are re-rendered automatically. That is any, any component that receives props from that component. So when data is retrieved, put it in a state array that was previously declared and it re-renders everything. Subsequently, if you filter it, and that's just with array name dot filter, open parentheses, x arrow, x dot name contains Fred, or whatever. That will trigger as it changes what's in the array. It doesn't get rid of what's there, it just changes what's in state, and that forces re-rendering. Rows of data from a table are returned as elements of an array. When you have an array, the dot map function is like a for next for arrays. For example, if you display data, if you have data, notice, remember this, these curly braces mean this is JavaScript. We want to take this state dot items because we're inside a class based component, dot map row such that create this component and for ID stick in the ID value from the current array member and the description value 
from the current array member. member and use them to output, output one of these components. How many of these components will you generate? Well, if items has 12 rows, they're going to be 12 of these. If items has 200 rows, they're going to be 200 of these. But it's just, this is just JavaScript. By the way, notice that this is in parentheses, and then when you refer to this item, it's all Evaluate that, evaluate that. What are these? They are the current element from items. Now, in the product item, notice that ID is lowercase in the array that it came from, which means it probably was lowercase in the SQL table it came from. But we assigned them to these two identifiers, which are being passed as props, capital I, capital D, and capital D, E, S, C. That's what we call them in the product item component because it's looking at product ID is what it got and it got a capital ID and a capital DESC. Function references can also be props. Let's say you have a, ver a, a, a state variable that you set as a value. You want to pass that down to a component where its value is displayed. But within that displayed component, you want to be able to click on a button and have it do something to that value. Well, the value is up in the calling component, not in the one that you passed the prop to. So you have to have a reference that says, go back to that component and change that property. Well, once it changes the value of that property, it's going to ripple back down to the component that contains the prop refers to it, right? Whoa, let's put this back. <clears throat> uh, my camera just dropped, although you can't see it, but there in a minute. So, this is the React way You declare a prop, give it whatever name you want, and then down within the function, you call onClick equals curly braces props dot reference name, and that references the function itself. Here's a very simple and not very good example. I've got a function called go which calls the set disk switch to false. You can assume that that's a state setter within a functional component. So down in the component, and then I, I go to, a, I, I display a component which has a routine called switcher, or rather it says switcher equals go, means it was, meaning it's referring to this function, and the variable it's passing is a local state property called SW. Now that's that's what it'll be called within the component that is component. So down in my component I have props.sw to display that value which is a variable in the calling component and I have this reference which says call props.switcher which means it's going to end up calling that function. One Looks funny, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> Finally, macro expansion. Nobody has macro expansion except FoxPro. I had a very sad episode in my career where some people asked me to rewrite an application that heavily depended on macros, but they didn't give me all the code. So I couldn't see what it was doing. And I worked for several months trying to get it to work. They wouldn't send me a working function. Turns out the guy didn't want me to see too much of the code because he didn't trust me. He to translate the code line by line from Foxpro to C Sharp. Because he was sure that that's the way you did it. And once he got enough of that, he could hand it to a bunch of his local pro, um, college student programmers and they could do the rest. And he thought that if I knew that he was going to replace me with less expensive programmers once he got the hang of it, that I, I wouldn't do it. Well, I'm a hired man whatever they tell me, you know, <laughs> but because I didn't know that there was going to be macro expansion because I didn't have the code, to edit, it took me a couple of months to figure out that what I was, what I was doing did not address his problem. I told him later, if you had told me that you had macro expansion, I would have told you it can't be done because it can't be done. Well, guess what? Macro expansion is back. JavaScript does macro expansion. You can either construct the expression 
and execute it, or you can just type it in and it will and it will run. Here's an example that builds a function consisting of for var i equals one to whatever, create element p and stuff the value into it, and append the children to it. I've got an example of this, and let's see if I can go over and run it. Oh, let's not do that. Let's, where do I have this? Well, I I have the example in the sample code. But you can put whatever you want as long as it constructs a valid JavaScript expression, and it will run it, and it will work. Just exactly like Foxforce Micro Expansion. It doesn't look quite as clean, but it does the same thing. Now, just to things to, a few things to keep in mind. First, you start the React app, and then go into app.js and start making changes. Start writing components. Start dragging them in. Start importing them. Start passing them props. If you have functions that need to operate on those props, pass reference to the props down into the components, and then have internally have an on change that calls name which refers to the reference that you passed it when you passed the, the component the value of the of the property itself if you like free data try MySQL it's almost identical to SQL you have to add semicolons at the end of the lines but other than that it looks just about the same it integrates perfectly with VS Code and by that I mean you can include an extension for MS SQL into Visual Studio Code and it drops the ID, it drops the management console for MSSQL into your editor. You can also add the Microsoft SQL extension into Visual Studio Code, and it puts an IDE, or rather a management console, right into your editor. You can do everything except browse, and frankly, you can do without that. I've been working with this for a year and a half. I learn something new about React every day. I run, learn something new 10 minutes before I started this presentation. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it is humbling, but it's good for you. And you'll really like the result, and your clients will like the result. And it's actually fun. Um, you were at school. There's a guy named Max Schwarzmüller. He is charming. And he, every, every course he does is just wonderful. He has a React course. He has JavaScript courses. He, he has tons of them, and they're all spectacular. So, And they're $13 each. So take a few. Take off a year and do it. Summary. React applications run just as fast as the coding. Once you get the hang of it, it's actually pretty fun. Your basket of deployables is about a dozen files. And thereafter, updating your website is effortless. You just FTP it. Data access using either script fetch or Axios's get for retrieving data and Axios's post, put, and the three basic operations is quite fast. Your users really can't tell that the data is on a server across the internet. Retrieve data state inside your page for as long as the browser is open because there's the design opportunity anything you've ever seen on the web your app can do there's something called let's see if I can remember it the CSS Zen garden ZEN CSS Zen garden it shows six or eight or ten web pages radically different, each one showing the same text. If you go into each one of them and look, there's only one line that's different, and it's the name of, this, of the cascading style sheet. The differences are enormous. It's all done with nothing but styling. So it'll give you an idea. You'll spend most of your time not writing code to do things, to figure out a way to do something even more interesting. Um, let me see if I can show you this one. Oh, 
well, it doesn't matter. I have an example um, that shows a menu. And it's just a little menu that does a slide out. And, and if you make the page smaller, it looks differently, like it looks different on a, on a phone than it does on a full web page, on a full page uh, monitor. It's not React. It's just style sheets and a tiny amount of JavaScript code. So React will not design your application for you. That's JavaScript and HTML. Better at it. You'll like it, but it may take a while. That is about all I have to say. Oh, macro expansion. Macro expansion is back. So that's pretty much all I've got to say on the topic. I guess I've gone exactly an hour, which is completely by chance. But if you've got any questions, you can ask them now. I'll be happy to stay here and answer any questions. Or you can call or email me. I will be happy to be your tech support. And Les, we have one question from the stage chat, which is, does the MySQL extension also work with MariaDB? Uh, I don't know what that is. No, MySQL works with MySQL. Uh, is MariaDB another database product? I haven't worked with it, so I'm not sure. It wasn't my question. So Yeah, uh, MSSQL extension works with Microsoft SQL Server. The MySQL extension works with MySQL, which is a separate product, although it's virtually word for word identical to, to uh, uh, Microsoft SQL in its syntax, except that you add semicolons at the end of every line. But I don't know about what other database products have extensions. I guess anybody can write one. It's an open. It's an open uh, um, platform. So anybody can. You can add one. <laughs> Do it yourself. Anyway, if there are any questions later on at any time, write or email me. On the CompuServe forum, I started answering FoxBase and FoxPro questions. I ended up with about two thousand thank you letters, which at one point I had in a box, and I've lost it but uh, from people that I helped just because I felt like sharing the goodness of Fox Pro. Well, I'm glad I did, but I feel like sharing the goodness of React now, and especially if you're trying to go from Fox Pro to React, give me a call, write me an email. Um, I'll be happy to help. That's it.